I was born in Rockhampton in 1938, which uh, seems a long time ago now. Rockhampton in those days was a mean old country cow town. There was not much in the way of sophistication. There was uh, no life of in, in art or theatre. There was, however, hunting and fishing and shooting. I'd been working on a beaut little country newspaper, the Rockhampton Bulletin, that I wanted to change, and I moved down to The Age. And joined The Age under the, uh, the God Editor, Graham Perkin, who was marvellous and nurtured me. And he gave me my first overseas posting, which was to London for a Queensland country boy. Uh, this was literally a whole new wonderful world. The troubles had broken out in Northern Ireland again. There was the Portuguese Revolution, the death of Franco in Spain, and I also travelled to the Middle East. After Europe, I came back, I became foreign editor of the age, uh, where I had a staff of about 10 overseas correspondents to manage. I also wrote a bit at that time, particularly on Aboriginal affairs, that the Aborigines had been dispossessed, that their culture was under huge attack. This led to me spending a lot of time in uh, the desert country, particularly with the Pitjaras. But my next posting was to uh, Asia, to Singapore, but my beat was from Vietnam round to Afghanistan and everything in between. I'd done some previous travel in the region, but I'd also studied a year of Asian government at the Australian National University. When the Filipino elections were called by the dictator Marcos, this was expected to be uh, a, a straight run, rigged election. However, Cory Aquino, the wid widow of the assassinated and popular opposition leader, launched a, a campaign against Marcos. The unofficial headquarters of the Cory campaign was the Hobbit House, which was staffed by midgets and dwarfs from throughout the, uh, the Philippines who, according to the owner, felt that they owned the place. Cory and the people won. And I actually went into the Malakanyang Palace, the presidential palace, the night uh, after Marcos had fled. And I went through the gates past the parked APCs, you know, the armoured personnel carriers, had, which had been abandoned. One of the fascinating people was Norodon Sihanouk. I, in fact, carried a message to Sihanouk from the Chinese Deputy Premier Li Xinlun, who'd asked me if I'd say to Sihanouk that the Chinese thought he should go back to Cambodia and join with the Khmer Rouge. Uh, and this led, led to a, a meltdown by Sihanouk, and he did finish up going back I've interviewed uh, Rajiv Ghani, Benazir Bhutto. She herself had been put in, and she was a tall woman, put into a very tiny cell. Uh, she was an absolute beauty, but also a highly intelligent woman, and a woman who was attempting to come to grips with both the poverty and the and the divisions in in Pakistan. I interviewed Nelson Mandela after his release from Robben Island. I felt I had to ask him about his wife Winnie, who was uh, a figure in, in mired in scandal at that time. And he paused and almost cried, and said, "You've got to remember what they did to her." I was fortunate with uh, Rupert Murdoch's help. He actually overruled his son Lachlan Murdoch uh, to get the Washington Posting. I arrived in Washington uh, hoping to cover the story of the world's remaining superpower and I wanted to write about the real America, but instead I was engulfed by the Monica Lewinsky saga. The pity of this was that Clinton could I think have been a really, a truly great president. When I talked to him, he intended to vote his second term to try to combat the, the deep issue of race in America. George Bush was, was a strange 
in a way, yeah, quite endearing man, uh, but a man who's never have been president. Uh, he was big on tennis and he was being coached by John Newcomb. And he asked me if I knew John Newcomb and I said, of course I did, which was almost true. I was fortunate through uh, legal friends of mine to be put in touch with Eddie Marbo. I was sitting in court that day next to Benito Marbo, Eddie's wife, and with uh, Kean Cohen, one of the QCs. And the judgment was read out and Kean Cohen got increasingly excited. And I said, what, what? And he said, this is big. For the first time, Australia has recognised the legal existence of Aborigines prior to white settlement. I went to Rwanda during the fighting for the Civil War and on the first visit into Kigali, the capital, which was still under attack, as we managed to find shelter with the help of the rebels, we were the first outsiders, my photographer and I, to a church called Naratanama Church. We went into the church where there were the bodies of probably about 3,000 men, women and children sort of starting to melt into one another in the tropical heat. Uh, they'd tried to take refuge there. They were surrounded by the government forces. It was chilling. Uh, I finished up saying to the RPF people as I, my last meeting with them, I hope you win and I hope you win quickly. This wasn't quite journalistic, uh, journalistic objectivity, but there was no place for that sort of objectivity in, in the hellhole that was Rwanda. I retired from print journalism, fleeing the Australian. The day of my retirement dinner, I said to my wife, Anne, that uh, I don't even have a hobby. And she looked slightly panic-stricken and said, I know. But that same day, I got an email from a literary agent saying she hoped I didn't mind, but she'd put my name forward to a publisher for a major book which would deal with uh, Japan, Australia, the prisoners of war on the Thai Burma Railway. And what I wanted to do was not just write about the, the trauma for the prisoners of war, uh, the, the brutality, of the Japanese. I wanted to put both countries in context. The last book I did was Australia on Horseback. I thought it would be a terrific idea to, to trace the role of the horse and the people who, who rode the horses uh, in the development of, of Australia. I'm very concerned uh, about journalism. Uh, I'm very concerned about print journalism. Uh, which, which is dying. It's been gutted. Social media, uh, which is destructive, I think, as a force, uh, has helped destroy print journalism, which, which I loved. My relaxations is, it's called the Gentlemen's Discussion Group, Women Welcome, and, and they are. Uh, the core of us are, are retired foreign correspondents who are given to telling tall tales but true and who will interrupt one another to uh, point out that, yeah, well, they'd been there too and they'd met you know, more interesting people and they'd, and they'd been shot at more times. I was going to say I'd like to retire, but I wouldn't. And at the moment uh, in my computer there are a few files uh, label Memoir 1, Memoir 2, Memoir 3. Uh, it, if I do it, it, it won't be my story, you know, tall tales but true, uh, about my life. Uh, it'll be more about, uh, I hope, a thematic uh, uh, book which will link the places I've been, the issues I've seen, uh, the troubles I've covered uh, in some sort of, yes, some sort of thing which may or may not gel together.